Welcome to Marine Tech Talk, a podcast about how Teledyne Marine's innovative technologies are enabling scientific discoveries and commercial tasks in the world's oceans and waterways. In this fall series of podcasts, we introduce some of the winners and general entrants from the 2020 Teledyne Marine Photo Contest. Teledyne's annual photo and data contest concluded with over 80 qualified submissions that helped the company donate more than $1,200 to save the children as part of our charitable giving campaign. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Art Trimbanis, a professor at the University of Delaware who develops and utilizes advanced autonomous systems to map and explore oceans and lakes around the world, filling in blank spots on the map. Art's contest submission was a photo of a Teledyne Gavia AUV, underwater in Bermuda, preparing to do some survey work around the Mesophotic Reefs in the area. Art's submission won him an honorable mention in this year's photo contest. Now, here is Art Trembanus with the host of Marine Tech Talk, Melissa Rossi. Art, you submitted a photo, actually a couple of great photos to our recent photo contest that Teledyne Marine runs every year. And uh, one of your images won um, our honorable mention. We had a lot of uh, really great um, submissions this year, so it's exciting to see all of the images. Before we get talking about the image a bit, uh, could you tell me a bit about yourself and uh, your program or what you do at the University of Delaware? Sure, no problem. So my name is Art Trembanis. I'm a professor of oceanography at the University of Delaware, and uh, I use robots to explore and map the uh, watery bits of our planet, everywhere from from the beach all the way out to uh, the continental shelf break and beyond. And if I'm not mistaken, you've been using autonomous vehicles, uh, ro- underwater robots, for quite some time. Is that true? Yeah, I am uh, definitely uh, an early adopter of uh, particular AUV technologies uh, going back to when I was a, a grad student, so uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, I had the, the benefit of having a really fantastic mentor and uh, a grad school professor uh, and, and, and Mark Patterson, who um, had founded one of the first uh, AUV companies, uh, literally out of his kitchen uh, table and, uh, and, and garage. And, uh, you know, I, I saw, you know, I think, you know, kind of the writing on the wall that autonomous systems, and at that time they were, you know, very, you know, still very early days of, of AUV systems and a lot of bugs were still getting worked out, but, uh, it was clear to me that that's where, that's where marine science was going to be going. And so I really jumped at, at the opportunity to kind of get involved in that at, at the ground floor. I'd always been a tinkerer. I, uh, had been involved with, uh, uh, in high school, we actually had a marine science, a four-year marine science program, and I got to build my very own turbidity meter for, for a senior project. And so that's one of the things I've always really liked about marine science is that uh, it is still a very young science. And, and uh, because we work in such a challenging, hostile environment, it's not as easy as uh, uh, yeah, NASA has in going to space. We've got real challenges. We have you know, intense pressures. Uh, currents, flows, things that will grow on on uh, instruments, uh, things that will try to chomp on instruments, and and fundamentally, fundamentally, electronics and seawater just just don't tend to mix very well. But provides some really interesting challenges. And so, I've always been a tinkerer, and and so um, you know, I, I I my research focus is really on 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 coastal coastal geology and coastal processes, understanding how waves and currents mold the the seafloor and, and coastlines. And, and so I saw some benefits, some real unique benefits that autonomous systems could provide access to that marine environment in ways that I otherwise couldn't. And they could stay down longer and, and travel further and go deeper and get closer to the seabed. And that really helps me to un- unravel what's going on down there. And, uh, and so that, that's been exciting. It's been, it's been a, a fun challenge. It's been interesting to just see how the field has uh, evolved and matured. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's people like yourself um, 
as you said, the early adopters of that technology have really made autonomous vehicles what they are today. I mean, uh, manufacturers uh, obviously have been making them not for that long, as you mentioned. Uh, it's still a fairly new science. However, it's people like yourself who've really pushed the envelope on what is possible and have requested, you know, upgrades and changes from the industry uh, that really have made uh, autonomous vehicles what they are now more reliable tool to be used than, you know, sort of a research project in and of themselves. The image that you sent in to us uh, was a beautiful picture uh, underwater of a Gavia AUV, and uh, the title was Mapping Mesophotic Reefs in Bermuda. So who took that image? Well, yeah, so that that beautiful image uh, of beautiful clear bluish uh, waters that the Bermuda is, is famous for was taken by one of our um, partner colleagues and, and divers at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science, uh, Mr. Alex Checker. And Alex is one of the, the uh, lead technical divers uh, there in, in Bermuda. And so he specializes in rebreather diving at, at um, quite substantial depth. This was at about 45 meters water depth. So you know, really getting beyond what would, you know, it's well and truly beyond what would be uh, recreational scuba diving limits at into this twilight zone, which which you can start to, to see some of that sort of twilight color in the in, in the image. There's there's no there's no filtering or anything uh, to to that image. It's just the, the photo that Alex created, and and we actually set that up for an opportunity to, to capture the vehicle underwater because it's normally something we don't get to see. Uh, especially when I work uh, in my local waters around Delaware, that the turbidity is just such that we really don't get a chance to, to see the vehicle. But um, in Bermuda and coral reef settings, it's great because we have this opportunity to see and hear the vehicle going by. And so we actually set out to do a, a scientific survey that day of some mesophotic reefs. And mesophotic reefs are these really important and still largely uh, unexplored and, and not fully understood coral reef systems. We tend to think of the real shallow water coral reefs that people can snorkel or, or scuba dive to. But these mesophotic reefs that exist in this twilight zone realm it can be anywhere from about 40 meters down to, you know, almost 200 meters water depth. Uh, they play a really important role because they, they, they are corals that have had to adapt to, to lower light levels. But also they've, they've uh, benefited from having generally more benign uh, con conditions, and they uh, often are, are less trafficked and less disturbed than their shallow water coral reef counterparts. And that makes them really uh, potentially very valuable for all sorts of undiscovered uh, discoveries of, of new species and, and, and behaviors as, as refuges for uh, for, for fish species as, uh, as refugia for shallow coral reefs. You know, we, we know our, our shallow coral reefs are, are really, really heavily stressed um, and under all sorts of uh, threats from local and global impacts. That includes overfishing, uh, climate change, diseases, and uh, these nearshore ecosystems, those nearshore coral reefs are particularly vulnerable to all the, you know, human in, impacts. And so those deeper reefs, these mesophotic reefs, are uh, really this uh, important, undiscovered, largely undiscovered country, and undiscovered because they're at the depths that make it very challenging. Uh, you know, uh, it takes you know very sophisticated uh, diving uh, to work in those depths, and and even even that, you know. So then you're putting humans in, into all sorts of you know challenging. Uh, domains and 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 even then carrying all this equipment of these rebreathers and things. There's only so far that divers can effectively traverse. And so the AUV systems for us, they don't replace the divers, uh, the scientific diving. They just enhance it. You know, it's 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 all about. I'm always telling my students, think about the technologies that we have, and try to match the technologies and their strengths to the appropriate application. You know, early on in my career. Um, you know, the AUV was about the only thing we really had in our, in our tool chest. And so when you have a, when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. And we've increasingly, you know, just realized that, you know, that the diversity of autonomous systems from autonomous surface vessels, AUVs, ROVs, each of these has strengths and capabilities uh, somewhat unique to that platform. And we try to look for how to best match those capabilities 
to an application and for visa photo grief systems, an AV is really a, a, a great way to look at um, landscape or seascape or we call reefscape uh, level um, surveys. So, um, you know, on the scale of, of kilometers, but where we can still get really high and complete coverage, both acoustically and increasingly using uh, optical systems, using cameras to, to document the reefs and, and their conditions. The, the point that you brought up about not having a lot of imagery of the vehicles working uh, deeper is absolutely true. That's one of the reasons that even we as manufacturers don't have a lot of underwater um, images because uh, at least here in the Northeast and in many areas, it's difficult to get that imagery. So that's why uh, the image that you submitted was specifically or, or um, really striking because uh, we don't have a lot of imagery like that. And one of the interesting things about this, so the mesophotic reefs, light can penetrate down that far because this doesn't appear to be that deep underwater, which is deceiving because clearly it is. So that is one of the um, the unique things about those reefs or in, in that particular area of the world, or is there something unique about the fact that the light can come down? Yeah, so, so generally, you know, the places where corals uh, live and thrive are warm tropical waters with generally, you know, clear, uh, clear water so that light can penetrate down into them. I mean, these athletic reefs, we're, we're learning, you know, it's really about light levels. You know, it, um, and, and there are some places where we, we see mesophotic reef type uh, reefs, uh, even in shallower depths, if there's uh, more turbidity in in the uh, in the water column. So, um, so tr- traditionally, typically, we think about mesophotic reefs as being these deeper, sort of forty, you know, to hundred meters or more uh, depths. Um, and and there's there's kind of some squishy domains to to, to what that sets because it's really it's depth, but it's really depth because of light penetration. And so the thing about the mesophotic reefs is they don't typically, they don't look necessarily as spectacular as, as, you know, we think of shallower reefs with, you know, uh, big branching coral They tend to be lower amplitude, lower uh, relief uh, structures, but they cover a really broad area. And so that's why, we, you know, we, we think they, they have a really important uh, role uh, to uh, to to offer in the, in the in the natural environment, we're really only beginning to sort of, you know, pry open the the door and and start to to take a look at them and get a sense of how they vary from from place to place. So a lot of our work has been uh, trying to compare mesophotic reefs in in different different areas. And one of the first times um, that we got to use the the Gavia was uh, in a Mesophotic reef study down in Bonaire, which is known as Diver's Paradise, and um, we were exploring down again down to these great uh, depths. And uh, yeah, you know, for for us, it's, it's very it's very rare that we get these these great places where we can where we can see see the vehicles. And and you know, Bermuda, there's a reason it's been such an important integral part of so much of marine technology uh, development from William Beebe and uh, and uh, uh, going, you know, down in in, in, the, in bath escape, and uh, um, you know, to just so much other uh, long, long-standing research there. Because in Bermuda, you can go, you know, two miles out and go, you know, two miles down practically, uh, because you have proximity to deep ocean water, and you have near, uh, near uh, to the coast uh, opportunities to explore coral reefs or or shipwrecks. So, you know, for me, it was a no-brainer. It was just a, a fantastic place. To, to try to bring the technology and put it through its paces and, and apply it in a new, uh, a new, uh, new application, um, you know, here to understand uh, uh, Bermuda's uh, uh, mesophotic reef systems. One of the things you mentioned was the diversity of life on these reefs. Um, and one of the striking things about this picture uh, is that while you can see that there are, I presume, coral growths on the bottom, I don't see a lot of fish life. Is that um, typical in these areas, or is it a fact of the the gavia being there? Maybe the sound of the AUV. Well, that's that's, that's a great question. I mean, one of the one of the great things that we've sort of learned uh, and seen over the years with AUV technology is that there isn't uh, a uh, conditioned. Uh, avoidance behavior amongst marine species, you know, including fish and marine mammals from AUV systems. And that's, 
that's been a, a real uh, a real godsend, really, to uh, to a lot of uh, a lot of what we do. So so it, it's we, we generally don't have too much aversion uh, going on, and there've been a number of studies where the benefit of that has has been shown. Uh, uh, British researchers looked at that in the Antarctic uh, using. Uh, the auto sub vehicle, they could, you know, they could see, and we, we've just anecdotally seen over the years that, you know, we'll still get, you know, fish and dolphins and other, you know, species will, will continue to be in the areas uh, around us. Um, I think instead in this particular case, what you're seeing in this photo is the fact that um, there has been a lot of overfishing uh, in, in the reefs of Bermuda and, and many of the other reefs throughout the, the, the Caribbean and, and, and throughout coral reefs around the world. And uh, um, particularly of the of the higher trophic level uh, predators, uh, the reefs in, in Bermuda are, are still in in many ways in, in 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 much better condition than other places in the in, in the Caribbean, say in the in the Florida Keys. Um, and the grazer populations are there that kind of help keep the algae at bay. So the sheep are there, but what's missing is a lot of the wolves, a lot of the larger predators. Um, things, groupers, sharks have been really, really decimated uh, by overfishing. And so um, we, we, we were seeing fish, and, and, they, and again, in, in particular in the mesophotic reef areas, a lot of those species try to hang out you know, in amongst the reef uh, crevice areas. So, um, and we were, we were going during the day. If we'd gone out at night, that's usually really the best time. Um, to to try to see you know a lot of these uh, species coming out and so you know for this particular uh, investigation we were interested in the in the corals their distribution um, you know where they were uh, but there there definitely are the fish there but but yeah you know, as is the case in, in many other uh, tropical coral uh, waters those uh, fish communities have have been uh, hammered very heavily. Mm, well, that's kind of sad. Are, so the AUV that you were using here, uh, you mentioned uh, surveys and also, um, I think, video capture. How is this AUV equipped? What sensors did you have on board? So, so we've um, added on to, to the vehicle a bit uh, over the years. The, the configuration that we were using uh, for this particular application uh, is, um, you know, kind of our what I call our standard sort of uh, seafloor uh, mapping configuration. So it includes... Uh, uh, Geoswap uh, phase measuring and bathymetric side scan sonar, marine sonic side scan sonar, and a downward looking color camera, uh, and also uh, water quality parameter sensors, including uh, an Indera uh, dissolved oxygen sensor and a wet labs eco puck for turbidity and, and uh, um, uh, chlorophyll measurements. And um, really, it's the combination of the, the sonar and the camera systems that, that gives us. Our, our best ways to sort of piece together the shape and distribution of, of the reefs. We can, we can generate three, 3D uh, bathymetric elevation models of the reef, drape the side scan over it, and then we, we work on trying to classify the seabed into areas of sand channels and maybe coral fragments versus areas where there's uh, uh, living coral, or we try to look at some of the different coral head uh, arrangements. And then the camera is an important piece of that, particular color, because then you want to be able to start to look at um, um, some of the coverage uh, types and getting, if not to species level, generally at least to like uh, genus or, or functional group uh, levels of, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the coral community. So. so the project that you were working out uh, here in Bermuda, was that um, just the University of Delaware project or were you, were you working with uh, BIOS while you were out there? So it was definitely a collaboration uh, with uh, some colleagues at, uh, at at BIOS, and it was also opportunistically uh, developed because uh, at the time I was running a a January term study abroad program for uh, University of Delaware students. So uh, we use our January terms uh, this coming year being a major exception because of uh, COVID nineteen. We tend to use our January terms for study abroad opportunities for for our students. I've taken students to. Uh, New Zealand several times to uh, Bonaire when we had a NOAA project down there. And this past year in 2019, um, I put together a program to take students to Bermuda because we figured, well, in January, when it's snowy and cold in, in, the, in, in the Northeast, getting to Bermuda is a kind of a, a nice uh, welcome uh, reprieve, and it gives us still the opportunity to get in the water. 
And it was a chance for us to bring some of our technology out there, AUV, ROV, drone systems, um, and, and, and put them into practice. So it was a very hands-on uh, opportunity for the students to not just you know, get lectures and, and see in theory how some of these technologies work, but they actually, the students actually helped plan missions. The students helped us go out and execute missions, launching the robots, you know, uh, dealing with the data afterwards. It was used as a, as a senior uh, capstone thesis project for, for a, a undergraduate senior who's now, now in grad school. And it was also an opportunity for us to um, do some pilot investigations with um, some core reef uh, scientists uh, then at then at BIOS, Dr. Uh, Gretchen Greenlee uh, Goodbody, who's who's now um, chief scientist down at the Little Cayman uh, at the uh, Central Caribbean Marine uh, Institute down in Little Cayman, and and, a, and is a coral reef and particular mesophotic reef uh, uh, specialist. And so this was an opportunity for for us to sort of bring the technology in concert with the work that uh, uh, Dr. Gretchen and, and her team does, which has primarily been uh, diver based, and so we saw an opportunity here to kind of expand the footprint of the work they were doing, and um, and get some get some practice at how can we leverage, you know, a technical diving together with the autonomous systems. Again, it's not it's not one replacing the other. It's not you know cars replacing horses. So we, we're looking for ways to to leverage these technologies in in their most complementary way. Um, and, you know, divers are great for looking at the individual, you know, trees in the, in the coral reef forest. AUVs are good at looking at the larger sort of forest context itself. And so the amazing thing is, is that it, just to show that how much of the ocean world is still so undiscovered and that, and that discoveries, you know, are always literally under our nose. We went out and did one, during one of our, our dives. Came, the vehicle came back on the surface. I was downloading the son, side scan sonar data and looking at it while I was on the boat, and that, my jaw dropped because I, I suddenly realized there was clearly a, a man-made object, a, some sort of a shipwreck. And uh, this was an area that was in line with the uh, the, the runway the, uh, there in Bermuda. And I thought initially, I thought maybe it's a. Is it, did it look like it was maybe part of a plane, maybe part of a wing, or is it part of a ship? And and uh, it wasn't on anybody's, you know, charts and sort of none of them. So we, we then did a, a follow-up investigation with the AUV and the divers, you know, on, on, that, uh, on that site and discovered that it was a more uh, modern barge that was, you know, probably sunk out there at, at, at some, some unknown time. But, but it actually led to us uh, informing the local uh, authorities and folks who are guardians for, for uh, wreckage in Bermuda uh, and, and we even discovered in that same era, we saw what was clearly part of some uh, bomb or projectile. There was some uh, piece of unexploded ordnance, and it, you know, again, it, it speaks to, to the to the to the history of different uh, activities. And that uh, you know, as Yogi Berra said, you can you can see a lot by looking. And 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 it was you know just one of these like, well, yeah, there we go, you know, made new discovery. I was going to ask you if you. Did. Uh, discovered anything unexpected. I'd say that's quite unexpected. And that was never um, found previously, so nobody knew that was down there. It's hard to say, you know, Bermuda is a, is a place that has been, you know, home to so much um, exploration and dive-based work that, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm always, you know, reticent to know whether, you know, were, were we the first maybe to see it or just the first to sort of note it and record it and bring it to somebody's uh, attention. Uh, and, and some of these things that have been known, I mean, they, they, they know in some of these areas near and around the, the runway areas that there have been places where there was dumping of, uh, of munitions or firing and testing, you know, particularly during World War II, Bermuda uh, was, a, you know, was a really important strategic uh, place. And we had actually earlier in the trip, just a few days earlier, Conducted a, a known uh, um, exploit, a known search, a search for a known but undocumented uh, wreck of a B twenty four bomber that had um, U S bomber that had that had tragically gone down uh, uh, during during the war, uh, uh, together with some of uh, some of the crew uh, on 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 board, and, and and the students actually helped to um, conduct. Conduct a search, you know, for that uh, for that particular plane. That's actually uh, uh, really interesting. That actually all of that um, archaeologic uh, 
uh, type work is interesting. It actually helps uh, also bring some closure to some families if they're still around as to what happened to either the plane or the ship. Uh, I know there's uh, a lot of the autonomous vehicles um, that we've uh, sold to customers have been used for that particular purpose. So, so overall, would you say that your research in the area was successful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we, we always sort of thought, wish that we could stay longer and cover more areas. Um, and uh, it's always a, a, a delicate balance between, um, you know, our, our, our teaching activities and our research. And in January, it can be a challenge in Bermuda sometimes to, to capture some weather windows uh, to, to do some of this work. But it, um, in terms of a, a pilot investigation, it was, it, was, it was very successful and has led to, to several other proposals and continued collaborations with the scientists there. Um, and like I said, for my students, for, for them being able to plan, execute a mission and find parts, you know, wing parts of a B-24 bomber, I think, I think for them, it, it almost seemed too easy. And I, I felt like they may, they may, they may have come away thinking that, <laughs> oh yeah, well, you just, you look at, you put an X on the spa on the, on the map, you run a mission, next thing you know, you sort of, uh, you know, find it. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it was successful and our chance also gave us a great opportunity to, um, to conduct outreach with the, the community in Bermuda. We had uh, school groups from elementary up through high school groups came to the campus. We were able to do some outreach events and, and uh, you know, demonstrate, you know, what some of the technology capabilities of these systems is. And for us, that, that's always a, a real rewarding opportunity when we can share uh, some of that and inspire maybe some, some you know, next generation of kids to, to think about opportunities in, in, in marine science, because I, I tell students, no matter what your, what your, what your interests are, there, there's some, there's some place and, and way in which you can apply that in, in marine science, whether it's, uh, you know, biology, chemistry, geology, physics, engineering, um, you know, economics, policy, you know, arts, uh, uh, any of these things, you know, there's, there's, there's a wealth of, of opportunity to, to be able to put those passions uh, in, into, into practice. Yeah, and it's people like you, Art, that actually help ignite those passions. So uh, kudos for all the work that you do uh, and the excitement that you bring to this generation and the next generation. Well, thank you. I, for, for me, I consider it paying it forward because I, I feel like I got the, the, the one of the best jobs on the planet, or at least it's certainly for me. I feel not so much like a, like a, like a job as a passion. So what happens next? I mean, are you guys able to actually plan uh, trips like this going into next year, not knowing what's going on with COVID or, or is everything on hold at this point? Yeah, things have uh, definitely been uh, placed on hold. I had a, a trip planned for uh, New Zealand for this uh, January and, and all of our, our January term uh, programs have, have been canceled out of an abundance of caution. And because uh, the place, many of the places we want to go to are themselves uh, severely uh, curtailing, um, you know, visitors, you know, we, we, we couldn't get to New Zealand right now if, if we wanted to, and I definitely would, would want to, but, uh, um, so instead I'm, I'm looking further into next summer, uh, and we're planning a project to go take students to Iceland and the Azores for a three week, uh, period. And, uh, hopefully if we can, if we can get the number of, of students and the funding together, we'll hopefully be able to bring some of this technology, uh, you know, with us. I mean, that's, you know, and so I think some of the some of the big, biggest challenges of what we do is just the logistics and, and efforts to, to to deal with paperwork and shipping and, and getting you know equipment from one place to the other, particularly when we're going to more remote uh, locations. So that's that's kind of next on the on the uh, on the on the docket in terms of a, a similar kind of a, uh, in, in investigation. And and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gretchen and I have. Um, several other proposals to continue doing our collaborations together, taking the same approach that we put into practice in Bermuda and and using it down in uh, the Cayman Islands, uh, where they have um, also these um, mesophotic uh, reefs that that still have been largely unexplored. So we'll hopefully we'll get a chance uh, to go to. Uh, you know, some, some of those sites. Well, it sounds pretty good. And if you do make it back to Iceland uh, with the vehicle, the vehicle gets to go back to its place of birth, uh, since that's that's where it originated from. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, that's right. So we, uh, I, I have, I have on my on my tour 
uh, a placeholder for for a visit to the factory uh, and and to visit some of our friends and colleagues that we've worked with uh, over the years and and get to give the students a chance to you know to see you know see where the AUV comes from. Please do. We'd love to have you there. I'm certain. So. Uh, Thank you very much. I appreciate all the time you've taken today to talk about the image and the science behind the image. That's, uh, it's been great. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for listening to the Marine Tech Talk podcast. If you'd like more information about the programs at the University of Delaware, we'll put a link to the department's Twitter handle in the notes for this episode. If you'd like to follow the work that Art Trembanis has been doing around the globe, We'll also put a link to his personal Twitter handle in there as well. If you have any questions or comments about this show, you can email host Melissa Rossi at marinetechtalk at teledyne.com. If you like this podcast, please make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're hearing this show. That way, you'll never miss an episode.